Welcome everyone to the Rest Podcast, where our goal is to help each and every one of you displace confusion, chaos, and dis-ease in order to heal and find significance in life. I am your host, Natalie Williams, and I am here with the author of The Reconstitution Method for Healing and Rest, Virginia Dixon. Thank you for tuning back in after our Thanksgiving break. We hope yours was as restful as ours was. And I got to apply a few of the things Nanda and Dr. Shiraji shared with us in the last few episodes. If you did, please message us on social media to tell us your story. Today, we're going to be doing a rest Q&A, a little unorthodox to what we usually do, I know, but we've had some great questions come in that we've been asked to address. Virginia, do you want to go ahead and read a few of those questions? Sure, I'd be happy to. Welcome back, yes. everyone. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. There are many questions that came in, and we picked a few. Some are a little bit more complicated than others, and I may not be able to address them as I'd like to. So you may be getting a phone call from us if you submitted a phone number or an email with these questions. The first listener asks, what could be the cause of a sibling group all developing different forms of cancer? That's a tough question. Yeah. Because when I first read that question, I had... Literally hundreds of questions. Follow-up questions. Follow-up questions <laughs> yeah. flashed through my thoughts. So because of the limitation of time, I would say that I would take into account initially that the, the first thing that comes to mind, if I have a group of siblings and everybody in that family has cancer, I would want to take developmental information into account, Mm -hmm. meaning what was happening in mom and dad's life. And I'm big on this one year prior to conception, what was happening when those children were in the womb, what was happening in the home. And I would be specifically paying attention to issues of attachment. Is it a violent home? Are there addictions in the home? So the developmental stages of the children in that specific home would be of specific interest to me. The emotional and the environmental conditions of the home, electric magnetic fields, environmental toxins, where the home is built, where the water supply is coming from, what happened in that land or what took place in that land were there factories there before Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of environmental factors i would want to take into account but certainly emfs pollutants and i would also want to know what the diet of the family is right i would put that into the environment not just the physical environment but what's the intake yeah Then thirdly, I would want to take into account generational and family systems. Mm -hmm. We always say these states of confusion, chaos, and dis-ease that sometimes manifest in states of disease, like in this particular question, it would be cancer. I'd really need to understand family systems two, three, four generations removed. And... It's like we've said numerous times on this podcast, when we're dealing with something like cancer and even autoimmune diseases, any state of dis-ease, we go at it from all angles. But if we have a family system and everybody has cancer, there are so many layers to that that it's too difficult of a question to answer without taking all those things into account. Yeah, because it's every single person and every single sibling in regards to where they fall in the family system. So whether mm-hmm. they're a firstborn, secondborn, or thirdborn, and then you got to think about have there been any miscarriages before that? And that's in the mom, that's also in the grandmother, mm-hmm. that's on both sides. It, Yeah, it's and, very complex. And very practical things, diet, environment, oh, stress yeah. factors. I mean, there's just so many practical things. But I do want to invite this person to send us their phone number and email and I will call them personally and see if we can't help unwrap or solve that riddle because it's like a sweater. If we can find the snag, right? It's amazing what can happen. The whole dilemma can unravel. Mm -hmm. And be solved. And be solved, or at least we have action steps. We know what to do. Right. 
Yeah, these things don't have to be scary if we can just calm down and realize that at the end of the day, we're all a spirit working through a soul in a body. And by the time states of disease manifest, they have a root cause and we can trace it. We can find it and we can turn every single stone until we find the patterns that caused these states. Yeah. So I don't know. I hope that's sufficient. But this is one person I'd like to speak to personally. I'd be happy to call them. Question number two is a big story. And we were not able to reach this person to get permission to read their whole story. In its entirety, yeah. In its entirety. But I do want to mention aspects of it. Hi, Virginia. Firstly, I wanted to let you know that your podcast has been such a blessing. You've put into words so many things that I believe and value and have been working to shift in my life. I'm sad that at this point I'm not able to attend one of your events. Currently, I'm no longer employed because of government mandates in my area. The weight of all that has been happening, not just here but around the world, has been challenging. I'm wondering if you could answer a few questions. Anger was an impermissible emotion to feel growing up. My father and my mother raged, but we as children were not allowed to process the consequence of those feelings. As a young wife, I had to come to terms and deal with anger. I too was caring. As a woman in my 40s, I am not the same person I was 20 years ago. I feel like I found a conduit for my anger by learning to express and assert boundaries, weep, lament, and pray, or write in my journal. However, I've been seeing new evidence on the science allowing emotions to move through us physically as well. Some utilize dance and martial arts, and others use somatic movements, and others have found help in rage smash rooms. I have not accessed any of these, but I feel stuck where anger is concerned, and I feel that talking about it isn't enough. Could you please speak to this? This is a great story, and by the way, it's consistent with what I hear at least twice a week. Yeah. This is not an unusual situation, and I would go as far as to say we haven't seen anything yet. When this next generation comes of age yeah i think this story will be so common that it's going to send chills up and down our spines yeah so this is not an unusual situation what i would say to this listener is first of all good for you for listening good for you for stretching Mm -hmm. good for you for having the courage to look at your mom and dad and your entire family system and recognize that it was what it was Mm -hmm. and now things are what they are and you will do what you need to do yeah and i think that takes a lot of courage and i think it takes a lot of wisdom so i just want to commend this listener and everyone who comes from at the end of the day these chaotic homes When we grow up in homes where there's abuse or addictions illustrated by our thumb (laughs) and our index finger, right, flapping back and forth, that's a chaotic home. Yeah, controller-victim. Controller-victim dynamic. Why? Because in that home, there was a lot of confusion, chaos, and disease, and the spheres of influence and the structures of authority were all flipped. Yeah. And confusing. And in many cases, dangerous. Mm -hmm. So that's a chaotic attachment style. So I would say to the listener that as a child, you were a victim of circumstances you could not step outside of to do anything about. You're a child. And the control that took place in your home that victimized you was overwhelming at times. Mm -hmm. So you tried pleasing avoiding you tried to be vigilant hyper vigilant vacillate so you could minimize the likelihood of further harm coming to you 
or in some cases your mom or your dad or your siblings. Mm -hmm. And of course, you tried to also avoid. So that's what creates so much of the chaos that translates into a significant amount of anger because that's a lot of energy that is stuck in your body and you don't know how to digest and process all those feelings because like you said, I'll speak directly to the listener, like you said, home was not a safe place. Mm-hmm. But I do want you to take into account all the lovely, wonderful, life-giving things that you intuitively did, mm-hmm. right? The whole process As a it. victim, yes, yeah. you knew to shut your mouth and be quiet. Mm-hmm. That's good. It is a survival response that is natural when you see danger. Mm-hmm. Control. You had to exercise control over the little things that you could control to not be overwhelmed by the reality that you faced. Then you were hypervigilant. Of course, you needed to be hypervigilant so you could protect yourself, your siblings, maybe your mom or your dad, but you could stay out of harm's way. Mm -hmm. And then you pleased. Of course you pleased. You did everything you could to leverage any hope of peace in that home and so you pleased mm-hmm. for peace. Yeah, peacekeeping versus peace peacekeeping. Making. Exactly. And and that's that was a survival instinct. Yeah. That was necessary. Your brain knew exactly what to do. And then you avoided. Who wouldn't avoid conflict and danger? So I want to say to the listener, you did all the right things and your brain did everything it needed to to preserve mm-hmm. as much as possible safety. Yeah. And to preserve your life. That's the function of the brain, mm-hmm. right? To s- preserve life. Congruent, by the way, with the fundamental law of nature, which is the preservation of life. Right. But you have a soul, a mind, a heart, a will, a conscience, a feelings. And at that time and during that season, you didn't know how to negotiate all of those things. Probably didn't even have words for for, it. Exactly. So what does the brain do? The brain says, I've got this. So these are all positive, adaptive responses that the brain says, I've got this, and it overrides everything else. Meanwhile, your sweet heart and your soul are shattered. They're broken. They're displaced. So there is a measure, I think, when we grow up in highly chaotic homes of dissociation that takes place. 100%, yeah. Right. And and I call that, I always refer to that as the disparity between that soul and what it contained and the central nervous system and how it responds to preserve life. The disparity between those two narratives is the anatomy of disease. Mm-hmm. And so reconciling those things and bringing them into alignment becomes really important in healing. So what I would say to this particular listener, if you're listening, I'm so happy. And if you're not, Natalie, make sure we find out who this is as well. So I can call her for a little bit. And the most important thing, she's doing it. And she's aware. Mm -hmm. This is where I came from. This is where I'm at. But it's not where I want to be. Right. And I'm stuck fleshing out these emotional states that are in my body, right? The emotions that are manifesting in my body. I would encourage the listener to read The Body Keeps the Score or to listen to the book. I think it's free on YouTube. You can listen to the entire book. It's a little complicated, but it's relevant, it's applicable, and it's going to resonate with you. I would recommend is that you really understand how chaotic attachment style manifests in how you love and how you live and how you dream and how you plan because it's really destabilizing to your current family but it can stop if you can identify in fact i've lived like a victim and a controller because if that was the pain and that was the attachment imposed on me by my family of origin, my parents, it's likely what I'm going to carry on and how I raise my kids. And this is a real trigger point for most people. Yeah. Because the response is, I'm nothing like my mom. I'm nothing like my dad. Mm-hmm. And my family is nothing like the family. As a matter of fact, I don't want anything to do with them. That's not true. We become the thing we hate when we don't understand how to release the bitterness 
the anger and how to step and live in this place of forgiveness. Right. Because forgiveness is about us, not them. But I don't want to get into those deep waters. In the most practical way, I want to encourage this listener to really understand that she has a chaotic attachment style. Mm -hmm. That means she was victimized and she lived in a highly controlling home. And as a result, a measure of both stuck with her. And that's how she lives and that's how she loves. And she also may have a propensity to vacillate, to please, and to avoid. And those things can flip quickly, making her feel like she's mentally ill. She is not She needs to understand that her central nervous system is regulating. Uh, I would venture to say before you go into the mental illness category, pause a minute and understand that your brain did everything it needed to to preserve your life. Yeah. And you need to be intentional now about understanding. I was victimized because I couldn't do anything about the circumstances I found myself in. I was a child and I was raised by really controlling, unhealthy people that had maladaptive ways of loving. And I learned how to love from them. Mm -hmm. So the likelihood of me carrying that legacy is going to be good if I don't understand how to break out of this cycle. And if you go to the resource that I've put on our website, How We Love, Mm -hmm. and if you need more information, go to Relationship 180 and follow Mylin and Kay Yorkovich. They talk about attachment. And I would encourage them to start there. And I think another question that she asked underneath, you know, a lot of people do take these more physical routes to release their anger. So that's martial arts. That is smash and rage rooms Mm -hmm. where you're breaking pottery with, you know, baseball bats and hammers and things like that to release their anger. Do you think that those things actually do help the body process? hundred percent. And I think it's vitally important. I will never, ever forget. My husband got up at 536 in the morning for 25, 30 years. Yeah. 25 years and would go play racquetball mm-hmm. and one day which was unusual for him but he called me from work and he said virginia don't ever let me stop playing racquetball i'm a different human it changes my entire perspective for that day wow and he grew up in a highly chaotic home and had that kind of attachment style and i wish i would have had the wisdom and the understanding that i have today this was 30 years ago right And I thought, oh, that's so, that's wonderful. I'm glad you're doing something you love. How shallow. No, his very life depended, and his health and his mental health depended on his capacity to get out there every single day and work out. Yeah. And it changed his mindset the entire day. His prism was completely different. And what's interesting, Natalie, as well, yes. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is he always had this inclination to get into martial arts Mm. and it's one thing he never did but he kept saying i just want to take martial arts i want to learn the techniques and the methods and he he felt so drawn to it do you know dr bessel van der kolk who as you all know is one of my professors i studied trauma with him for one year he said that yoga martial arts were instrumental in dealing with depression and anxiety, and very complex emotions that ail us, especially when we have had any kind of trauma in our lives. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, and I can't cite the work right now, but he had research to substantiate that they were more effective than antidepressants. That's amazing. It makes sense because it's our own body creating the hormones that we need, you know, to actually be balanced. And releasing, releasing the toxic emotions and the sweating and everything. And we'll get into the anatomy of all of that. But I hope the listener finds that helpful. And I would also like to speak with her directly if you can find her for me. Yeah, of course. And I find it helpful, too, because... I'm now considering doing martial arts. (laughs) (laughs) I'm only five feet, two. I need something. (laughs) I know. And it's the medicinal, I think consequence of yoga and martial arts when you really think about the art i know there's people with deep religious convictions that are concerned about potential harm Mm. from those practices it's another big conversation and we're going to do a podcast on this too i 
say the world is God's and everything in it. Yeah. And it's the heart with which we approach everything. As you know, I'm Italian, and my family is of European descent. Yeah. I was born in Montevideo in Uruguay in South America. But I don't remember family dinners without wine. Mm-hmm. And I never touched a drink in high school. Yeah, you've mentioned this before. I've mentioned this before. And so it's, I don't know, I think we make a lot of things taboos that become, I don't know, I won't go yeah. down that. But I just think we need to be careful. But we'll talk about this at length later when I'm more prepared to address it. Oh, yeah, I think it's great. I think the biggest thing to take from it is, you know, to you have liberty, so you can do your research. And if doing it does not match your convictions, if you're like, mm-hmm. no, you know what, I, I can't do this, you know, then find mm-hmm. another route. There's mm-hmm. multiple routes to help the body process. And I agree with her. Like sometimes, you know, just talking about it is not enough. So if you need to go and exercise, if you need to do something else to help, then by all means. And the it. research is 100% pointing that direction direction oh yeah that it's the body that keeps the score Mm -hmm. and we can't neglect what's happening to the body bringing that in alignment with your deepest convictions your mind your heart your soul your feelings and your religious convictions becomes really important to take into consideration but it's a it's a great conversation and we'll expound on it next year yeah, that sounds good. I want to ask the next question, or at least preface it a little bit, mm-hmm. because on Instagram, Jenna answered a question about physical deficiencies and the specific symptoms that point to those physical deficiencies. So um, we had a question that asked, you know, what are some symptoms of emotional or spiritual deficiencies? Confusion, chaos, and dis ease. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> that is it. If you're feeling confused, do not take action. Mm. Ask this question. If I'm confused, there's a lie I'm believing about myself or somebody else or a situation. Spend however, whatever time, take whatever time you need to displace the confusion. And the easiest way I find to displace confusion is to ask myself, where's a lie? Right. Where is where is the lie? Sometimes it's pertaining a conversation, a person, an event, a decision. Something we tell ourselves. Something we tell ourselves. But that's the easiest way I have of not spiraling and dissenting into covering, hiding, blaming, and just spiraling. Yeah. Yeah. And we've talked before about how specific symptoms of that would be like depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. So my main question is, do you think it is that confusion that leads to depression and anxiety? Well, those are big topics, Mm -hmm. right? Depression and anxiety. We're talking about that so much. Yeah. But they're very complicated emotions. Mm -hmm. And you know me. I'm about finding the feelings and the root cause of those emotions. Right. And that's how I help people displace confusion and chaos. And by the grace of God, we do it effectively. Yes. But it's complicated. And I, I'll tell you this much. I've never known a pill to resolve it long term. So I'm all about taking, as you well know, a holistic approach a functional approach, meaning looking at all the moving parts to unravel the anxiety and the depression. People have to be willing to do that. Yeah. And people have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right. And sometimes it means dealing with addictions and dealing with meds and remedies and divorces. And it it takes all that sometimes. I would like to think that through vehicles like this podcast, we're causing people to say, hold on a second. There's a lot of layers here that I can take into account and not just say, I am depressed. Right. Maybe you're grieving. Maybe you're sad. Maybe there's unresolved pain. I want to encourage our listeners to be careful before you say, I'm depressed. Yeah, don't just resign yourself to that diagnosis. To these to- diagnoses. Yeah. yeah, people are self-diagnosing. And it's, it's easier to use these terms, but it's like a very wide, thick brush stroke. And I think it doesn't, it does us individually and corporately a great disservice. I agree. There's a lot of beautiful things behind depression 
and anxiety that you get to go wonder about and unveil. And be your own detective. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I think also, I mean, in regards to these emotional deficiencies, we hear a lot of people, we have a lot of people come in that are in relationships that are feeling like they're emotionally deficient in their mm-hmm. relationship. And I've always looked at relationships almost like a piggy bank, right? You know, mm-hmm. you you make deposits in the piggy bank with your significant other, and then you also can make withdrawals too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of times we have to learn how to voice our specific needs to our significant other so that they can help us and and deposit specifically what we need in that piggy bank. So I want to ask, you know, how should someone approach their significant other with their needs without making that person feel inadequate, without shifting blame, like really coming at it with um, a heart of like, you know, I love I love you, I love us, and this is something that I need. You know, how, how would you mm-hmm. say someone could approach well, that? Well, I think two things. If you don't mind, I want to go back and yeah. address the whole concept of emotional deficiency. Okay. I, and this, I haven't had enough time to think about this because as you know, I just came from back to back to back appointments the last 10 days to recording this segment. I'm inclined to believe, or I should say I've observed that it's not a deficiency of emotions Mm -hmm. that we're feeling. There's a disconnect sometimes. Mm -hmm from a myriad of feelings that we can't access. Interesting. So it's not so much a deficiency, it's a short circuit. Okay. Tree, if you will. Yeah. I tend to, I feel more comfortable with that. I feel more comfortable discussing it, discussing that question in that context. Mm-hmm. So there's some short circuit tree. Sometimes there's huge disconnections yeah. between the soul and what's the body's manifesting, right? The brain, the limbic system, the emotions that people are emoting. Right. And sometimes they feel dead. They can't access them. Mm. So there's, an, there's a myriad of feelings that emote in chaotic ways mm-hmm. or they can't access them they can't access the emotions and they feel kind of like dead inside yeah but it's because there's a disconnection between anger generally and pain Mm -hmm. that they haven't accessed and so there again it's a complicated topic not complicated at all when i'm sitting face to face with someone but it can be complicated to discuss in general terms Mm -hmm. so i wanted to just i didn't want to let that deficiency word hang there because it's not that it's deficient it's this is a connection issue, overconnected, underconnected. Let's so, just say that. So then approaching it uh, or asking the significant other when it comes okay, to. Okay, so then yeah. to answer your question, because whether I'm overconnected or underconnected, you know I'm big on this. Mm-hmm. You've got to take a pulse and say, in this given situation, how do I feel? Mm-hmm. When people can acquire, develop the discipline of articulating how they feel. And by the way, we all need feeling words to do that. Yeah. Don't depend on your memory because you're going to get a different answer. You need to get a feeling word list from the internet. Just pull one out and say, how do I feel about X, Y, and Z that I want to talk to my partner about? How do I feel right now? For a vacillator, it would be lonely, mm. invisible. For an avoider, it would be annoyed, why can't they just handle it? What yeah. seems to be the problem? Why do we have to have a five-minute conversation about a 30-second issue? Mm-hmm. For a pleaser, it would be, I've tried everything. I don't know what else to try. Yeah. Or maybe I should get him a, get a cake or bring her a ring or flowers or, you know, yeah. whatever. They're going to find an, a, something to do to please. Mm-hmm. The victim's going to say, this never works out for me. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to suck it up and just take it. Yeah. Or nothing's ever going to change. I just need to accept this is the way it is. And who knows what I did to cause the problem. Mm. The controller is going to say, I'm going to handle this right now. I'm not putting up with this. Mm -hmm. And I expect this and this and this and this. 
So when you catch yourself, when you realize you're inclined to any of those five extremes, you need to say, stop. These feelings that I'm feeling right now and that I've identified, these feelings that I've identified did not start with my partner. These feelings have deep roots in my family of origin, perhaps in my ancestors. You see these family patterns and you need to say, no, Mm -hmm. that is not what's happening to my partner. So I think what's productive is to say, honey, to your spouse or to a friend, is this a good time to talk? I've been thinking about X, Y, and Z, and I realize that I feel invisible. I feel sad. I feel this need to control that's not healthy. Or I feel this need to just shut up and take it and don't say anything, don't rock the boat. Mm -hmm. Or I feel like I just want to run the other way, avoid. Or I'm feeling like I wanted to please you. And I realized not one single choice, option was suitable because it wasn't fair to you. Yeah. So I just want you to know that I'm working on identifying the root cause of whatever the feeling was. And I'm not attributing this to you or to the situation. I just want you to know that I'm trying to grow by identifying these triggers I have Mm -hmm. and be vulnerable with that and say at the same time, I wanted you to know that I'm working at identifying the root cause of some of these triggers. And I was hoping that I could practice communicating a fundamental need because I want to have a better relationship with you. I want the best relationship. I don't want anything to hinder our relationship. We're going the right direction. I want to keep going there and I want to take responsibility for myself. Yeah. And so when you can identify these places, these deficiencies, these maladaptive behaviors perhaps in yourself, like this sweet woman grew up in a highly chaotic home. Mm -hmm. Well, she doesn't want to continue the chaos. Yeah. But if chaotic people don't identify they're chaotic, they're going to be victims of everything. They're going to feel controlled and overrun by other people. Yep. They're going to feel like everything's hopeless because they tried being hypervigilant, they tried pleasing, and they tried avoiding, and nothing works. Yeah. Well, nothing's working because they're looking outside of themselves to resolve an internal conflict. Right. And so my advice would be to identify what's happening inside of you and find words to be humble and vulnerable. You can only be as close as you are vulnerable to one another. Yeah. So if your spouse is invulnerable, then you set the stage and learn how to be meek. Yeah. Meekness is strength under control. Mm-hmm. When a person, like the question number two, had the courage to write what she did, that's meekness. That's amazing. That is strength under control that says, and something's missing, and I'm working at correcting this, and in the context of it all, I want a better relationship with you, and I'm learning something, a skill I wasn't taught, as you well know. But th- these are wonderful opportunities to grow. Yeah. And I guess, Natalie, what comes to mind always is a giant puzzle. I'm always trying to put this puzzle together. It's a beautiful thing. It is. It can be frustrating sometimes. <laughs> but maybe look at it, if for those of you that like puzzles or have built puzzles before, even if you did so when you were children, you know how you got to get that last piece? But then you get so excited about the last piece, you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, there was one right here somewhere <laughs> that I remember fit here. That's kind of how I look at negotiating these conflicts that we have in these complicated times we live in. Yeah. Because the conflicts and the confusion, the chaos, the dis-ease that we're, that we're trying to reconcile isn't just within us. It's within not only our homes and our families and our spheres of influence, but look what's happening in a community level, in a state level, in a national level, in a global level. So once we get these principles established and we can become disciplined at applying these things within ourselves and our primary relationships, mom, dad, child, husband, I just think we're free. Yeah, hundred percent. And something that I loved, and you kept saying it over and over and over, is you were using all of these I statements, mm-hmm. and ta- it, it's taking extreme ownership over you and mm-hmm. your thought life and the things that you're prone to, and it it takes so much courage 
to do that. And it's, it's hard. Exactly. Because it's I, 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 it doesn't, I'm not imposing anything on you. Yeah. This is just the only prism I have. And I know it's a little skewed, right? And I'm trying to bring it all into focus. I'm learning how to do something. Yeah. I didn't learn how to do as a child. Yeah. And that is learn how to express anger or frustration or confusion or fear yeah or loneliness yeah right and i learned how to do this last year and for anyone who's really scared about starting it because they know how hard it's going to be when using those kinds of statements especially when talking to someone that you love they are so inclined to jump on the bandwagon and help you reconcile that yeah i think that's something that is so cool and so amazing and so helpful too. You're getting teary eyed. I am because it was just so like, I just remember it so well. Anyway, I'm going to start crying if we keep talking about this. I know. I'm surprised. I know. This is one of the best lessons that you ever taught me. Oh, what was it? I'm thankful. Oh, you're welcome. I'm happy. Okay. Close us (laughs) with what was the lesson? (laughs) Oh, well, the lesson was being, I mean, I'm already an introspective person, but really being okay with admitting that I have faults, not just that, but that I can fix them, that I have a desire, right? Yeah, I have the desire and I have the ability and the power and the liberty to do that. And I'm not just stuck and a victim of circumstances that I can grow above and beyond Mm. them. And gosh, (laughs) I did not expect this today, guys. (laughs) But that that has been by far the biggest lesson that I there's freedom in that, isn't there? Yeah, there's so much freedom and peace. Peace. There's so much peace. Mm Because you know that no matter what comes later on because you've already learned that lesson you know that you you will rise to the occasion if you choose to yeah and we're all better for it we are natalie's sitting here crying (laughs) realizing what a huge milestone that was for her to be able to identify feelings flaws confusion chaos maybe misunderstandings and realize that it doesn't diminish the listener and it didn't diminish her it made us all better. And when we do cross those milestones, there's peace. You're right. Yeah. It's a good note to close on. It is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Virginia. And I do want to tell everyone that's listening the three questions we were able to pull aside. I'm happy to contact those people individually. Yeah. I'll be reaching okay. out to them. So okay. expect a DM on Instagram. Those of you <laughs> whose, whose questions we answered. All right, everyone. So if you haven't been on social media or our website in a bit, Virginia will be in Adrian, Michigan, December 10th and 11th for a day of rest event. So all of the details are on the website and there is still time to register. If you're in that area, don't miss out because this is the last one of the year. Crazy to think about that the year is almost over. For updates about rest and this podcast, please visit our Instagram or Facebook, The Place of Rest. If you'd like more information about Virginia or to support and join the cause of rest, please go to virginiadixon.com forward slash collaborate. Thank you for listening to Rest with Virginia Dixon. We'll see you next week.